As a wave of killing swept across North India, Britain announced the date of her departure. The Raj would end in just 16 months, June 1948. For the overstretched British of the Indian police, the Indian Empire, after 150 years, could not end fast enough. Certainly I was almost at the end of my tether. We've been rioting since November 1946, with practically no rest, no sleep. And day after day, there was one crisis or another to deal with. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led 90 million Muslims, a quarter of the population, who feared Britain would hand them over to the 300 million Hindus. The Muslims dreaded a Hindu Raj. Civil war now threatened. I felt that we were stretched to the limit of our resources. And my police were having to operate in such appalling conditions. And there were mob confrontations. And uh, I got terribly worried about my police because whereas before all this boiled up, it was anti-British. Now they realized, the crowds realized that, it was, that we were determined to grant independence. And it became virulently a case of hatred between the communities. The violence engulfed five huge provinces of northern India. The Hindu majority in one village, hearing of their kinsfolk killed in another, turned on the few Muslims in their midst. Rumour spread the infection of slaughter. The province of the Punjab was to be the heart of Pakistan, the homeland the Muslims wanted carved out of India. Around the capital, Lahore, Muslims were the majority. Here they felt secure. But the east of the Punjab was dominated by Sikhs. They had a warrior tradition and were close allies of the Hindus. Sikh fear of being swept into Pakistan now raised their hatred of Muslims to a frenzy. The smell of death hung over the Punjab. As the British prepared to go, the killing threatened to become organized mass slaughter. My Sikh and Hindu police were being singled out by the Muslim mobs for, uh, for violence. And in fact, they came along to me saying, you British and your Muslim police could do what they like to us, but we're not going to have your Hindus and Sikhs. We won't answer for the consequences. So it was a very worrying situation because we were a thoroughly integrated force. Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee decided that he must himself take charge. Attlee had one objective, Britain must quit India. The mood of the government at home was to decolonialize. Uh, so far as I was concerned, I was impressed by the fervor of, of the nationalist movement in India, and I thought, if there's no disposition at home, and it just wasn't on in the political climate of the times to maintain our rule in India by force, uh, the sooner we got out, the better. Britain's capacity to dominate India had been drained by six years of war. The British presence had been cut to the bone. Half the district officers were Indian now. With the violence between the two communities, Hindus and Sikhs on the one side, Muslims on the other, getting worse, the British felt it was essential to go quickly before they totally lost control. The danger was worst in Lahore. The Muslims got up on their roofs and they were shouting to each other across the rooftops the Urdu word for beware, khabadar, khabadar. This sounded almost like a pack of jackals. I think people were simply scared to death. People who had been living quite peacefully for many years, uh, Muslims at one end of the street, Hindus or Sikhs at the other, uh, they suddenly found they couldn't trust uh, their neighbors. They were really terrified of being bombed or shot at or having a house set fire to. There was a sort of snowball effect of fear 
spreading right through the city in the hall. And the same thing, I think, happened in Amritsar and other uh, big cities in, in the Punjab. It was very awful to watch it happen. The killings and destruction were now straining the meager British administration to breaking point. I personally saw a lorry load of corpses. There were women who had been stripped naked, appallingly mutilated, and left on the side of the road in the whole city. And since they were Muslim women, I could only assume that they had been murdered by Sikhs or Hindus. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led the Muslim League, the dominant voice of Islam in India. He demanded the partition of India to create Pakistan. The British had persuaded Jinnah to abandon his demand for Pakistan in return for a large share of power in a united India. But Jawaharlal Nehru, the leader of Congress, India's largest political movement, feared that the deal had given Jinnah too much. Congress backed away. Jinnah was furious. His Muslim supporters started the killings that threatened to destroy any solution. The British were now desperate to leave. Civil war was a near certainty unless Britain moved quickly. In December 1946, Attlee decided to appoint a new viceroy. His inspired choice took everyone by surprise. Lord Louis Mountbatten, cousin of the king, was appointed to end British rule in India. Mountbatten insisted on the time limit of just 16 months. He was to secure agreement between Muslims and Hindus. If he could not, Britain would leave in June 1948, come what may. When Mr. Attlee asked me to take on this job, he rather took my breath away. This wasn't something that could be decided straight off. And in fact, we had several meetings about it. I asked to see the king. As king emperor, he kept very close touch with Indian affairs. I pointed out to him that the chances of complete failure were very great. And it would be bad for him to have a member of his family fail. He replied, but think how good it would be for the monarchy if you succeed. And he then asked me formally to accept the appointment. The scene is Northolt Airfield, the occasion the departure of Lord Mountbatten of Burma, who was leaving for India with his wife. Before the new Viceroy, there lay the task of holding office for the brief but obviously difficult period of just over a year until the date when Indians are to take full control of India. Lord Mountbatten's recently married daughter, Lady Brabourne, was there with her husband to see them off. So too was Lieutenant Mountbatten, formerly Prince Philip of Greece. Everyone in Britain, I'm certain, wishes the Viceroy all possible success in India. Uh, and you see, it was a great thing to send a, a member of the royal family as the last Viceroy to India. It was a brilliant notion of Atlas because it very greatly pleased them. Uh, and they thought, well, at least sort of the royal family itself is taking part in this uh, uh, historic handover and so on. Before he went, you know, Mark Batten said to me, uh, do you think uh, I should go just in sort of plain clothes and arrive as Viceroy like that? Because after all, they're all very left-wing and so on. I said, good Lord, no. Put on your best admiral's uniform, all your medals, do the lot, have bands playing when you arrive. Oh, good, he said. I'm so glad. <laughs> but he loved uniform. That's <laughs> exactly what he did. And, of course, he went down a tree. Mountbatten was one of the most uh, ambitious people in the world. He was one of the most egoistical, too. He thought a great deal of himself. And above all, he wanted to do brilliantly. This was the apotheosis of his career, and he knew it. And he wasn't going to make a ball of it if he possibly could. And, of course, he didn't. He became really, uh, I wouldn't say loved, but uh, respected 
over and beyond the call of duty by most Indians, particularly by Nehru, who, who formed a, a very considerable attachment, not so much to him, but to his wife, but nonetheless, it, 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 it helped. <laughs> and, uh, no, I think he will be remembered as the most successful amateur politician. <laughs> Mountbatten had driven a hard political bargain with an increasingly desperate Prime Minister. He had insisted on a free hand, the right to make decisions on the spot without reference to London. His predecessor, Lord Wavell, never had a free hand. Batten had been a senior war commander. Attlee banked on him to avert a disaster. On March the 22nd, 1947, Mount Batten was installed as the last British Viceroy of India. Everything moved so well, and it was because they themselves were both very proficient. He had this German quality of extreme discipline and, and proficiency, and everything had to be perfect. It was a very social household. There were dinner parties and drink parties, and um, we knew that it was the end of an era. Everybody in that house knew that when Mountbatten left, there was going to be prohibition so that everybody was determined to drink the Viceroy's cellar dry. And that didn't make for a clear head early in the morning, except that Lord Louis, as we called him, and Lady Louis always were clear-headed and knew exactly what they were going to do with the rest of the day. And we would follow rather bleary-eyed and often muddled and do the best we could. He was very vain. He was extremely good-looking. And he had only to walk into a room and every female heart fluttered. And he knew that, and he'd stand there with a very look-at-me sort of uh, attitude and, and charm everybody in, in the room. He enjoyed the way he looked and the fact that the ADC who walked behind him would generally carry a comb so that when Lord Louis stepped out of a plane or a car, he could see that his hair was in place. And in sharp contrast, she never really cared how she looked. She didn't care whether her hair looked right or whether her makeup was all right or not. And very often friends of hers who came out from England would say, well, she's, you've only got two dresses, it seems to me. Don't you think you ought to have a few more? And it, she, she never cared about that sort of thing. And that, too, was very endearing. I think Mark Batten's personal glory was probably never very far from his mind. He brought out with him two young women whose sole job was to cut out and paste into enormous portfolios all the pictures and references to him that appeared in the Indian press. And I would guess that now at Rumsey is the best documented life of anybody who's ever lived in this country. I don't know, but I would think that there is a beautifully and completely documented life of Mount Batten. Had he chosen to go on the stage, he, he would have outshone Laurence Olivier. I could see that everything was going to depend upon personal relationships. If I could build up an atmosphere of trust and understanding with the key figures, I might succeed. If I couldn't do that, I knew I hadn't got a hope. And of course, all this had to be done in such a way that none of them could think that the others were being privileged or getting away with backstairs methods. Most lacking in trust was Jinnah. He had won the support of the Muslims with a simple battle cry, Pakistan, a separate Muslim state. But it hardly looked a practical idea. 
The League was asking for four provinces in the northwest and two in the east, which would make a Pakistan suspended in two halves, with almost nothing in common and 800 miles of India in between. Jinnah refused to discuss these drawbacks to Pakistan or any matters that might have caused divisions within the Muslim League. He was used to being in control, and before meeting Mountbatten, he prepared himself with care. It was generally regarded that Jinnah was a remote and rather cold personality. And uh, before the meeting took place, uh, we went out uh, into the garden uh, for, a, for a official photograph, and Jinnah did his very best to be charming. He stood with Lord and Lady Louis, the idea being, of course, that Lady Louis would be in the middle and Mr. Jinnah and Mountbatten on both sides. And Jinnah made his first effort at the charming remark, describing, saying that she was a rose between two thorns. Unfortunately, he was in the middle. What did he say to you after his first meeting with Jinnah? Well, he said, by God, he is cold. Which he was. Uh, uh, Jinnah uh, was a very remote, very uh, austere figure. And uh, I don't think he was going to be charmed in quite the same way as some of the other leaders were. Jinnah had few friends. No one knew him well. And he kept one secret that might have changed history. In early 1947, Jinnah learned his life was nearly over. He had incurable TB. Had Congress or the British known, they would have redoubled their efforts to keep India united. Gandhi, above all, hated the idea of partition. Without Jinnah, he would have vetoed it. He could still cause trouble. When he started calling Edwina and me his dear friends, I began to have the feeling that we were halfway home. It was characteristic of Gandhi that at our very next meeting, the next day in fact, he proposed as a solution to India's problems that I should ask Jinnah to form an administration. He really meant it, even though he must have realized that this meant giving the Muslims virtual control. Anything rather than see India divided or have a civil war. Of course, it was quite impractical. I told him he must first get the support of the Congress party. And this, he naturally failed to get. But that was Gandhi. Nehru was already a friend, of course, my first meeting with him had been almost exactly a year before when he visited Singapore whilst I was still Supreme Commander, Southeast Asia. He knew now that he would get a fair deal from me. With Nehru, the trust I was trying to build up with the leaders was already there, and more than trust, friendship. It was not only between him and me, but with Edwina, and my daughters Patricia and Pamela too. He believed that our whole family loved India and would try and do what was right for India. You see, my father was rather starved. Uh, when you have a, a rather rich personality, a many-sided personality, you need a number of different relationships in order to, um, you know, feel fully alive. And I think that he was missing that type of conversation earlier, which he got with the Mountbatten. And, and a, a closer touch with the newer ideas of the Western world. Mountbatten had the great merit of perceiving from the outset and sticking firmly to it, perceiving at the outset that he must keep Nero on his side. He perceived that and never lost sight of it. That was partly the secret of his success. It's rather a terrible thing for me to say. My brother's colleagues, uh, for many years being men, who, s who were identified in spirit, loyalty, love, spoke a different language. And here was this Englishman who was closer to him, vis-a-vis -vis the background, you know, and a very sophisticated and clever man who knew just how far to go with Nehru. Nehru led Congress, the government in waiting. The problem was Jinnah. The state of Pakistan that he had led the Muslims to demand would include millions of Hindus and Sikhs. The province of Bengal was slightly more than half Muslim, but it was almost half non-Muslim, 
and its capital, Calcutta, was the largest Hindu city in India. The Punjab was similar, half Muslim, but containing millions of Sikhs, who defiantly launched their own claim for a state. And in the rest of India, another 40 million Muslims were scattered. If Jinnah's Pakistan was created, they would be left out. He argued there must be partition. Otherwise, as a minority community, the Muslims would be swamped in Hindu India. Right, I said, then by the same argument, the two provinces you want in Pakistan with large non-Muslim minorities will also have to be partitioned. Oh no, you can't do that. Punjabi unity and Bengali unity are much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. In that case, I said, surely Indian unity is much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. Oh no, said Jinnah, we must have Pakistan. And so it went on. A circular argument, round and round the mulberry bush. I never met anybody who could say no so persistently and so effectively. Jinnah was now the prisoner of his own propaganda. He could not withdraw the Pakistan demand or persuade the British to give it to him in full. He had to wait till the moment when the time came for the real distribution of power. He wouldn't like to disclose his hand beforehand because that would expose him. He wouldn't like to overcall because the bluff could always be uh, exposed. So he had to wait till the decisive moment. And I think that was the correct strategy as far as I see as a student of politics also and as one who has happened to work with him, that was the correct strategy at the time, to wait till the last minute. Because the British were all, we were not sure about the British also. When they would leave? When they would leave. And naturally, when they decided to leave, then he disclosed his hand. Even before Mountbatten arrived, Congress leaders, except Gandhi, had accepted partition. Congress were desperate to secure an effective government in Delhi. But if United India included Jinnah, it looked increasingly ungovernable. They called Jinnah's bluff and agreed to Pakistan. What else could be done? You see, when you get gangrene in your leg, you have to cut it off, isn't it? If you allow it to remain, the whole body gets gangrene. Congress feared a civil war. The leaders were worried that Britain might delay independence until no governable India was left for anyone to take over. They're getting on, you see. And none of them young men. I was young, so I could take a different view, younger than them. But they probably felt this was it. How long were they going to be in the wilderness? Not everyone likes being in the wilderness. I think they had had enough. They want to settle for what was possible. Nehru wanted a strong India. To get it, a partition that removed some Muslim areas was necessary. It was a price he was reluctantly prepared to pay. Oh, very reluctant. There was no acceptance in any sense of the word as, a, as something that was right. It was just something that had to be, and well, let's make it as good as we can. Gandhi, the father figure of Congress, had always opposed any partition of India. Now, in June 1947, he chose to remain silent and say nothing. He began to realize that he was not at the center of the, uh, at this moment in time, of the Congress negotiating position. And so, being a master of symbolism, which he always was, uh, he used uh, his realization of this by when he saw Mountbatten at a key moment in the negotiations to say to him that this is my day of silence. And by, you know, on his day of silence, he had to write notes. He didn't say anything. He wrote it on the back of an envelope that, it, that Mountbatten would realize that he, Gandhi, today could say nothing because it was his day of silence. That was his, if you like, uh, symbolic way of saying that he was no longer going to take a, a veto position or a central position in the, in the discussion. Gandhi, who had repeatedly frustrated British policy by well-publicized fasts unto death, now chose not to protest. Gandhi pushed himself aside. He had asserted himself in moments when he wanted to. Why did he at that time not stand up and say, kill me, and then take Pakistan? He didn't. 
Mountbatten's award followed the plan Congress had already outlined. Jinnah was given Pakistan, but it was much smaller than he had demanded. Instead of the whole of Bengal, he would get the Muslim area only. And in the Punjab, he would receive only the West. Jinnah had called this a truncated and moth-eaten Pakistan. He had said he would never accept it. Now, in the closing days of the Raj, would Jinnah fight on or give in? The meetings with Jinnah were very difficult on these matters. He was legalistic, he was formal. And on one occasion, during one of these discussions, when Mountbatten thought he was carrying, with, carrying him with him, Jinnah said, no, Your Excellency, he said, I can't agree, but I accept. So Mountbatten said, well, Mr. Jinnah, you're playing with words. It really it needs it is a serious matter, and uh, I really can't follow that kind of uh, distinction. But he left it at that. Came the day of the actual key meeting, the meeting of the leaders for, in effect, passing a fifth of the human race into new, new into a new order, a very great moment. Now, Baden opened the proceedings to say that this was a very great moment in history. The leaders were now assembled for this great responsibility. He said, I think we have reached a moment, and he looked at Mr. Jinnah, he said, not where we will all agree, but where we must all accept what is going to happen. Jinnah nodded his head and said, today, agreement is accepted. I must say that I feel the Viceroy has battled against various forces very bravely. And the impression that he has left on my mind is he was actuated by high sense of fairness and impartiality. And it is up to us to make his task less difficult. But behind Jinnah's diplomatic language lay a crushing defeat. Mountbatten and Congress had kept Pakistan to a bare minimum. We have therefore decided to accept these proposals. It is with no joy in my heart that I commend these proposals to you, though I have no doubt in my mind that this is the right course. The proposal to allow certain parts to secede is painful for any of us to contemplate. <coughs> Nevertheless, I am convinced that our present decision is the right one. We are little men serving great causes, but because the cause is great, something of that greatness falls upon us also. Mighty forces are at work in the world today and in India, and I have no doubt that we are ushering in a period of greatness for India. By June 1947, all parties had agreed on partition. But every day, the slaughter between Muslims and Hindus was getting worse. Bengal in the east was now the flashpoint. To prevent further killings, Gandhi went on a fast to death. During his fast, processions marched through the city with the people shouting, let Gandhi break his fast. And although the disturbances lasted for some time, the miracle, as many Indians describe it, was eventually accomplished. After about 73 hours, the city was reported as quiet and Gandhi ended his fast. Mountbatten feared that if he stayed the full year, a raging civil war would break out. The Raj, he decided, must be ended fast. With little ceremony for once, Mountbatten announced that Britain was about to leave and a year earlier than promised. It was uh, extremely well stage managed, and there was this great number of foreign correspondents from all over the world. Uh, and when somebody asked about the date of handing over, because at that time, as you know, the whole idea was that June 48 was going to be. And so everybody was working roughly on that assumption. 
and he said um, 14th, 15th, August. And there was a pin drop silence, pin drop silence. And everybody thought that he has not correctly what he'd forgotten. And, um, and after that he turned around uh, 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 and he said, uh, that is all what you wanted. Freedom quickly, independence quickly, I've given it to you. Partition was now to be in seven weeks, not 12 months. Sir Cyril Radcliffe arrived in Delhi. He sat poring over outdated maps and population data. He had to decide the partition line in the two provinces, Punjab and Bengal. Radcliffe had just 37 days. It was so childish. You had a calendar and you took a page out. And you were dividing a subcontinent, or I should say continent. This continent is bigger than that of Europe. <laughs> and there it was. For Radcliffe, the partition of Bengal between Muslims and Hindus was difficult enough. But it was the other partition, the Punjab, that was the greater problem. There, the Muslims and Sikhs were hopelessly intermixed. Their crops depended on irrigation by canal. If the boundary cut a canal, the enemy controlled the lifeline. The killing now reached fever pitch. Muslims in East Punjab began moving out of India to the safety of their future homeland, Pakistan. In the west of the province, the Sikhs, fearful of being trapped in the Muslim state to be, headed east to India. For once, Mountbatten had slipped up. He himself had underestimated uh, the um, appalling consequences uh, of partition in the, in the north. He didn't realize that the Sikhs would fight as they did and, and what appalling massacres would occur between the two communities. As each side began a mass slaughter of the other, Sikhs headed for Amritsar with its golden temple, the holy shrine of the Sikhs. The killing in North India, which was to overshadow the first months of independence, had begun. And twice to Lord Mountbatten, I told that we fear that the Sikhs are organizing um, um, a planned violence in, in the parts of in which they are in a majority and that we apprehend very grave uh, consequences, to which Lord Mountbatten said, I should not bother about it for a second. They will have the situation completely in control. That, no. that need not trouble me in the least. Millions were on the move. Every family desperate to be on the right side of the boundary line. Whether on foot or crammed into trains or buses, the refugees were easy prey to armed bands from the other side. The killing went on till November 1947. I was reporting for the BBC and I had a microphone recorder, a small portable recorder. And I remember that I was, had a jeep going up. And again and again, I used to sing of these massacres taking place, certainly on the, on the Grand Trunk Road itself, where people tried to tap people down. I'd lift up the microphone and said, the BBC is watching you, BBC watching you, and they'd stop. The next ordinary thing was in the middle of all these scenes, nobody for a moment touched me or any European. 
we were the untouchables. They left nice as possible away. I remember one afternoon there was a convoy which came across from Firozpur in India. And uh, these refugees were in a very miserable condition. Uh, it was not uncommon to find as many as 200 or 300 men, women and children coming along stark naked without a stitch of clothing on them. They were horribly mutilated, maimed. Some of them had broken limbs. Uh, the women had their breasts cut off. Uh, there were children carrying dead children just for the sake of burying them in the soil of Pakistan. And uh, all told, uh, it was not a very pretty sight, I can assure you. Lady Mountbatten has been paying visits to refugee camps and listening to many fearful stories of the fighting. At Jolanda and Amritsar, for example, thousands of refugees told her of their appalling experiences. As if the massacres were not enough, floods have added to the terrible tribulations of the people of the Punjab. The heavy rains have swollen the river Ravi, and many refugees have been stranded, unable to cross to safety. Some food has been dropped by air, but the tragedy is on too big a scale for such a solution. There is little safety even in travel by railway, for many trains have been attacked and the passengers killed. The trains ran a serious risk. They had to water the engines, and there were Anglo-Indian drivers who shunt the train into a siding, go off to water the engines, that gave the seat bands a chance. They'd come in and they'd go right through the train and kill everybody. The train would then shunt onto Lahore, where in the siding they'd have to take the dead out. And they were a terrible sight. I don't go into details, but you can imagine. And they could almost see them coming with the fly swarms around them. And when the bodies were taken out and laid down, and there would be about 2,000 at a time. I never forget one station official turning to me, who would obviously used to order the pride of, of uh, British India, was the railways, it was a tremendous system. And he looked at that and he said to me, in a voice I never forget, Sir, it is hardly worth issuing tickets anymore. A good man horrified by the collapse of water. And next door was the Walton railway station. We were taking these trains there because otherwise people were getting worked up in the hall. And there you saw bodies of women, loaded bodies of women, some sucking their babies. And these uh, lances strike through the babies and the mothers. Bloated bodies, pulling them out, all, it was, you couldn't sort of get to those uh, compartments, number one, on account of the uh, smell that was there. And then, to look at those bodies, uh, you just, no human being could stand the sight of women in such, such condition, cut up and badly raped and badly uh, handled. I saw a railway station in Amritsar where I had gone to receive somebody that the local people got hold of a boy and when his pants were taken off, he was found to be circumcised and they said, you are a Muslim. And he begged of them that he was not Muslim. His mother cried and she said, we are Hindu and he is not a Muslim boy. But because of the circumcision, you know, he was killed right in the railway station. Our parents, they made us together in one room, locked us in one room, and brought kerosene aisle for us, there, in that room. And they said, okay, whenever there is any raid, we will burn you up there. And even we girls, we were prepared for that. We you were prepared to be burnt up rather than fall yes, in the hands of we, the Muslims? Yes, we preferred death to disgrace at that time. My own sister-in-law, 
she was uh, stabbed there uh, by her own husband because he was uh, she was being removed by the muslim people so he just killed her there right in our own house in Walpur, where I was, most of the Sikhs in villages left of their own accord before anything had happened, very wisely. But once this turmoil had started, any Sikh in Walpur, I ultimately said to myself, he's a dead man unless he's under my direct eye. As I looked at each day's new results of communal discord, I realized that in their present mood, the religious groups were just not going to be able to live together. They were tearing their country to pieces. Mountbatten made only two visits to the riot areas. His priority was to get out before British prestige collapsed entirely amid the slaughter. I think that this was the only big mistake he, he, he made. I think that otherwise he was pretty well informed that he was... The important thing was that he, he did realize uh, that we had to keep to a very rapid timetable if we were to able, if we were going to be able to leave India uh, in peace and without a, a complete breakdown of the administration. In July, Mountbatten set up a Punjab boundary force to police the future dividing line. It had an impossible job. Its 55,000 soldiers could not cover hundreds of miles of countryside. Reduced to virtual spectators, its British officers could only send Mountbatten daily situation reports as the killings went on. 20th of June, 1947. Since last report, there have been 14 killed, 50 injured, 38 fires and three bomb explosions. Report number 697, 14th of July, 1947. A bomb exploded outside a Sikh canteen and there was immediately a free fight. Eight persons were killed and 35 injured. 8th of August 1947, Amritsar and Lahore cities continue to give trouble, daily casualties running at between 50 and 100. Report number 704, 13th of August 1947, the Muslims in Amritsar district have hit back and in a village named Jalalabad have eliminated a local Hindu minority, killing probably over 70 people. Situation reports which were uh, made up in sent in quintuplicate, uh, one copy went to the cabinet, I know, um, two or three copies were retained in India, and one, one always heard, went to Churchill. But these sit reps went in every day with an assessment of casualties uh, and were made up from reports from all over the, this very large area. Uh, it is true that um, they were difficult to assess, but based on what one saw oneself, there's no reason to, to think that something of the order of a million men, women and children, civilians, uh, was by no means unlikely. It's always been my own view and one which I personally have not departed from. It's impossible to conceive of, of 500,000 being, being slaughtered in that way. I just don't believe that and I think it was, I, I would say at the outside, people involved in casualties Killed, killed and wounded, would have been inside 250,000, inside it. How many people actually were killed since you were there as the body counter for the BBC? I think the massacre total has been seriously underestimated. I know a figure of a quarter of a million has been suggested and almost officially accepted. It's a long time ago now and I don't think I pain anybody by saying that that figure is seriously underestimated. I think it was certainly getting more towards the million. You couldn't make a, a possibly an accurate account because these massacres were taking place in lonely places, in all sorts of uh, villages, little towns, also the Punjab and on, on, in Sikhistan. Yes, I think I would go on record, stick my neck out and say uh, nearly a million. Killed? Yes, I would say so. Mountbatten wanted to be the head of state, the governor general of both the two new Commonwealth members, India and Pakistan. Nehru suggested it. Jinnah said no. So on August the 13th, the last viceroy was in Karachi.
to see Jinnah installed as Pakistan's first governor general. Muslims of India have shown to the world that they are a united nation and their cause is just and righteous, which cannot be denied. But the celebrations couldn't hide the reality. Lacking an army and civil service, even government files and typewriters, Pakistan began life with few tangible assets. While the crowds cheered in Karachi, no one will ever know whether Jinnah felt happy at the Pakistan he had created. But in India the following day, everyone was happy. The scene in Delhi was typical of hundreds of towns throughout the vast territory that was about to become the dominion of India. Cows being held sacred by the Hindus are never driven off the pavements, and all the familiar activities to be witnessed in this teeming city were being carried on as usual. But there was an undercurrent of pent-up excitement, for everyone knew that India, Hindustan India, was now to be free and independent. Independence Night was superb. We came out onto the balcony of the, uh, the, the Legislative Assembly and looked straight down this huge avenue that the Gain Lutyens had planned for great state occasions. There must have been a million people there, uh, no exaggeration. And there was a roar, a bubbling, a, a roar of utter happiness. And when the conch horn sounded and India was independent, that was the night, the very moment, 12 o'clock midnight, a roar came to that crowd such I've never heard before. And I've heard great many rallies, great crowds. In fact, I, I was at the Nuremberg rally when Hitler appeared. This was a different roar. This was a roar of utter happiness, content, and never were the British more popular. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. I happened to be outside the Parliament House when uh, Nehru made this famous Tryst with Destiny speech. It was, it was an enormous crowd and somehow one had forgotten all about what we'd been through in the killings and the riots all along. Uh, and one felt very elated. At long last, the country was free and we could manage our own affairs. It was next morning near Prince's Place where Mountbatten's went in their horse-drawn carriage to the Red Fort. I couldn't believe the crowd took the horses away and dragged this carriage themselves, cheering the British. And very staid, stiff British officers in uniforms were lifted shoulder high and cheered. It seemed that 150 years of bitterness and all the anti-British feeling had totally vanished and uh, this nation become more pro-British than it had ever been since the British came. I take the view that Mountbatten is coupled. He got all the British troops out without a single casualty and Indians and Pakistanis murdered and butchered in the most cruel way. I think the withdrawal of British power was too sudden and uh, rather selfish. So I do not admire either the dignity or the grace. It was very popular then. Mountbatten became an Indian hero.
So I would say yes, Mountbatten did a very good job for Britain. Did a very lousy job for India. Next week, Malaya. You can get the book End of Empire at all good bookstores and from the ABC shop in your capital city. Next on ABC after the news, the Royal Ballet with Cinderella. Cinderella.